Welcome to the Shepherd's Pie, a slice of hope to raise faithful kids, where we focus on topics that impact young people today. I'm Antony Barone Kolenk. I'm a father of five who served in the Air Force for 21 years. I'm now a law professor and a columnist for Practical Homeschooling Magazine. I'm also the author of The Harwood Mysteries, an inspirational medieval fiction series for kids aged 10 and up. Here on The Shepherd's Pie, we want to inform, inspire, and help you to raise happy, healthy, faithful kids, whether you're a youth leader, a pastor, a parent, anyone. In today's episode, I speak with Keisha Russell, counsel with the First Liberty Institute. We talk about the difficult but critical matter of speaking with kids about the issue of race and race relations. And in the entertainment segment of the show, I review the movie, The Best of Enemies. The issue of race has been an ongoing and difficult topic to address in our books, but especially in the news media. Sometimes it seems like we're going backwards on the issue of race relations in this country. And this is not a topic we can avoid with our kids because it's all around us and messages are coming at them at school and on their television screens. But what is a healthy way to think about race and to talk to kids on the topic? My guest today, Keisha Russell, is a first-generation American and the daughter of Jamaican immigrants and who has a lot to share about how we can talk to our kids about race and how race should interact in our overall identities. Today I am with Keisha Russell. She's an attorney with First Liberty Institute, which concentrates on religious liberty matters and First Amendment rights. She was a 2011 Teach for America Corps member in the Atlanta Public Schools, where she was an elementary special education teacher. She also attended Emory School of Law in Atlanta, where she was heavily involved with their prestigious Center for the Study of Law and Religion. She worked as a law clerk for the American Center for Law and Justice. She has had her commentary published in lots of different outlets, including foxnews.com and the Washington Examiner. And she's also been a guest on such shows as Fox and Friends. Keisha, thank you so much for coming to The Shepherd's Pie. Thanks for having me on. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? I grew up in the earliest part of my life in Broward County. I was actually born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my mom and and dad moved us out, me and my sister, out of Philadelphia because it was just such a bad neighborhood. And my mom doesn't like the cold. Neither does my father. Actually, they're Jamaican. So I'm actually first-generation American. So I'm the first generation of my family born in America. We moved to Florida. Um, I went to really good schools. Um, Mostly, they were all public schools, but they were very good. I got an amazing education in those public schools. And then for high school, I went to a magnet school. Well, I went to undergrad at the University of Central Florida, and as I, you know, became a Christian, God really took my career in a different direction. I worked at a couple of colleges and universities in Atlanta. From there, pursued a master's degree at the University of Southern California. I did that online, uh, got a master's in teaching, and then I started teaching in Atlanta Public Schools, simultaneously uh, becoming a core member with Teach for America. Uh, But right around the midpoint of my second year, I started to feel really called to go to law school. I do have a very like fierce, fiery, intense passion for justice. And so actually got into um, a school, uh, like a lower ranked school in Atlanta. And then I ended up being third in my class there and transferred to Emory. That's when sort of the trajectory of my life changed. I obviously became involved in the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. And from pretty much the moment I went to Emory, I was kind of adopted into that center by a really brilliant professor, rabbi, and lawyer, uh, Dr. Mark Goldfeder, who was a lawyer at, with ACLJ and adjunct professor at Emory. And he kind of trained me in that in religious liberty litigation. And that's kind of how things started. Great. And so when you were a public school teacher, 
And was that in uh, in sort of like the inner city Atlanta public schools or some of the oh, suburbs? Oh yes. the worst area of Atlanta, highest crime rate, highest rate of poverty. Overall, I did enjoy teaching. It was extremely challenging uh, because of the placement. And it wasn't just special education. I taught students with behavioral disorders. And those students often had other disorders, you know, intellectual disabilities and um, other things. But the primary reason for their disability was behavioral related. And so, so I taught fourth and fifth grade, all subjects in one room. So comparatively speaking, going into Atlanta public schools, compared to what I had experienced in my own upbringing, my students sort of, particularly the special education students, it, it was uh, baffling to me that, they, that many of them had gone this far, fourth and fifth grade, and many of them could not read. And certainly none of them could read well at that point. By the time I was in fourth or fifth grade, I, I was reading like novels. And I think I read a Stephen King novel when I was in sixth grade. It was, it was, I really shouldn't have been reading. It was way over my head. It was Firestarter. I should not have been reading that book, but I could have read it. I did the exact same thing. Not only did I read Firestarter and then I read Jaws. And, uh, and ever since then, I've been terrified of the ocean. <laughs> but, yeah, right. you know, Probably a sixth grader shouldn't be reading Jaws either. Yeah, but my students were not at that place. And so I think that was the thing that was most alarming to me was their inability to read because that's all I had done up until like middle school and then you discover boys, right? And then I was less intrigued with books at that point. I was still pretty much a bookworm, but for most of my life, that's what kept me occupied. Even though, you know, I taught most, all of my students were Black, but I felt like we had so little in common other than our skin color. We had very different upbringings, very different views of the world. And certainly the educational background was different. So it was definitely a jarring experience, but I welcomed the challenge and I, and I felt really compelled to do what I could. If I, I would tell them, if you learn how to read, you can teach yourself anything and you won't need anybody. And so I made it my mission to teach them how to read. And I did. So, I mean, and that I think is a great segue into sort of the topic that I, I wanted us to spend a little bit of time on, which is this idea of, you know, how do we talk about race and race related issues to youth today? And so you do hear a lot about, I mean, especially in Atlanta, so you're in the South, segregated schools for most of the history. Um, still, and talk about that. segregated, but certainly still segregated. Yeah, you said every, every student in your class was Black. So, I guess maybe my first question would be like, how are we supposed to think about how our education system relates to race? I mean, you hear a lot about the history and how that history lingers on and still impacts us today. I mean, what are your thoughts having worked in that uh, arena and especially having come from a different arena yourself growing up? To me, the education system is as impacted by our racially charged history as the criminal justice system. For a lot of reasons, because a lot of people think systemic racism is not really a thing, which I don't completely agree with. I think there are a lot of systems that were put in place on purpose uh, in our past that are still operating as sort of automatic cultural system. Maybe there's not somebody actually designing these things or imposing these systems purposely, but they are still there because they're just part of the fabric of our culture. Um, as a result of the, his, the past um, and the history. And so I think our education system in, in many ways reflects that. I think we should teach our, our history factually and tell students what happened. But I do think that, for example, in like critical race theory, I think the mistake that is made is sort of in this modernized version of critical race theory. This sort of over emphasis on race, which for me is counterproductive if we educate our students in a way that leaves them feeling in any way inferior or superior because of the way they look, that's counterproductive to the goal of education and uh, a student should, should leave a classroom feeling like they can do whatever they put their mind to, which is how I was raised. You know, consequently, my my parents never, they never talked about me being black, never. I can never remember my dad or my mom ever mentioning us being black. I don't remember ever hearing it, not once, really. Some of our more adult conversations later, now my parents, you know, they're not they weren't Christians or anything. So they had their own sort of views of the world that in some ways I may or may not agree with now because I am a Christian. But the one thing they did teach me that was very, very beneficial was sort of this idea of um, being self-motivated. 
if I said I wanted to do something, the next question was, well, how are you going to figure out how to do it? There was never sort of this, well, it might be harder for you because we never had those conversations ever. Can I ask you a follow up on that? So but you're, you told me your parents came from Jamaica to this country. They were in Philadelphia as first generation Jamaican immigrants. Mm-hmm. They surely must have had some difficult time. Do you have a sense as to why, you know, they didn't perceive this is something that that they wanted to talk about with you or was it not part of their experience? I think that, and this is just my hypothesis. You know, I spent many summers in Jamaica and, you know, everyone's cognizant of the fact that they're black, but remember in Jamaica, everyone in power is black. Everyone who's perceived as beautiful is black. There's no sort of idea that you're superior to people who are white. I mean, that that's not really super ingrained in the culture there. And then when they came as Jamaican immigrants, there was, in some ways, I think they they expressed that there were some battles sometimes between them and the Black Americans uh, because they were immigrants, right? And yeah, I'm sure they had some racial conflicts with people who were white, but I don't think, my parents, I don't think ever really saw their success or failure as being tied to their race, ever. That's just not how they were brought up, and it wasn't the way I was brought up. For them, it was just completely irrelevant. I think even though, like, like your race may bring some barriers in your interactions with people, or you may experience some level of discrimination because of it. And I think in their eyes and in my eyes, you're going to experience some level of opposition for all kinds of reasons that may or may not be linked to your race. You may experience that because of the way you look, whether you're attractive or not, or gender, or... or Whether you're really short like me. (laughs) <laughs> oh right you know like there's a song those... short people have no reason to live right so uh well, i'm only five two and i certainly think uh, you know right yeah so like i felt like for men it's like a huge you know that's a bigger <laughs> deal than if you're a woman right so i mean there's all sorts of reasons i'm not i'm not at all downplaying the issues that black people face in america i just think that in many ways if we teach children to rely on themselves and acknowledge that they may experience certain opposition because of their race or because of whatever, that ultimately they're the ones who will control what happens to their lives. And so they're never going around thinking that they can't get anywhere unless white people allow them to do so. You know, I just think that that is very counterproductive and not at all helpful. And I don't think it does anyone any good to, to, to think that. You mentioned critical race theory. What is critical race theory for those people who might not be familiar with it? Well, so what I say critical race theory Um, Because recognizing that critical race theory has been around for a long time and sort of the the past iterations of it, it was just the idea that our racial history and makeup, you know, has sort of these implications for us culturally. I think sort of the more modernized version of critical race theory is the idea that in some ways your race will be outcome determinative for you and that you should feel a certain way about that. I just feels like there's there's a lot of um, focus on the external and not enough on the power that people have internally. One of the aspects of it that I guess is, I'm under the impression of is that uh, the theory uses race as the lens by which to interpret all the world. else. Basically, right. interpret yes. history, interpret the actions of, of everybody that goes back to the founding of the country and before, and pretty much everything you see sort of has this race lens to it. I mean, that's a very rudimentary understanding, I think, that I have of at least one aspect of this. Yes. Um, I hear you saying that you don't necessarily think that's a great thing to use that one lens. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And not only do I believe that it's counterproductive to view the world that way, it's, it's certainly counterproductive to view yourself that way. I am more than just my race. I have much more to offer than that. And I don't, I, you know, I, I don't consider my race to be the sole or even primary part of my identity. Um, as a Christian, I consider my Christianity to be the primary point of my identity, which I know there are people who disagree with that because I've had conversations with them, but they're also not Christian. I, I also feel like, why would I choose to view my race as a con? Why would I accept the position that being Black is sort of an automatic ding or a problem when I can choose to view it a different way? I mean, I do think that historically, right, it was certainly not a complete barrier, but it was, there was some opposition 
to trying to become a successful and independent financially independent person and because you know being black in america but at this point i feel like we are as far removed from it as i think we're going to get in cultural society honestly because racism is a sin pattern you know it's it's part of the hearts of men it's not something that you can try to completely eradicate from society so sort of the idea of like microaggressions and things like this you can't you cannot legislate those kinds of things i mean you can make sure that racism is not so systemic that the laws are justifying or allowing the government to participate in invidious discrimination right but certainly you cannot legislate people being good people. And so I just think there has to be a balance there. And I think critical race theory does not have a proper balance. You know, what's interesting though, is as you're going through your history, your parents coming from Jamaica, moving here as already adults. And I wonder uh, and when you hear people talk about reparations for slavery and talking about the lingering effects, the generational effects of Jim Crow and slavery and all this, um, in some ways, I guess you were spared that because your parents did not grow up in America during that time. So I'm wondering if, if that's one of the responses that a critical race theory person might come back with is to say, well, the experience of Black Americans leads to a different outcome because of the fact that their ancestors were slaves here in America. Well, there was slavery in Jamaica, too. One way to really drive home what I'm trying to say is that it's really all about how you think about yourself, your circumstances, and your race. All that history is factual, right? That's just what happened. And there's no getting around that, and there's you shouldn't water that down. But do I believe that that history keeps Black people in the particular financial position? No, I don't. And here's why. Because many Black immigrants who are the same race come with nothing, like my parents, and they are able to lift their entire family out of poverty within a generation. And they're the same color. And some may say they might have even have more barriers because some of them have a language difference. You've got that barrier as well. And so there's there are a lot of things that could potentially become roadblocks for you if you're trying to be successful in America. And what I'm really trying to say is I think it's, it's more of a mental conditioning that is happening. And I think critical race theory is contributing to that condition, to people thinking that there is a barrier to how far they can go in society and how much money they can make and what they can do with their lives because of their race. That is categorically untrue. It is a lie. And I don't think it benefits us to believe that to be true, despite the fact that obviously we're going to know people and, and hear about people who face a lot of opposition because of their race. How do we, as adults, youth leaders, teachers, talking to youth specifically, where they see it in the news, they hear the rhetoric, in some ways, I think it's getting worse, uh, you know, in the last decade. I've had some students, even as a teacher myself, who, you know, I talk about religion, uh, you know, if I'm talking about religious liberty or something, I'm sure you must run into this too. I might run into, you know, an African-American student who has an extremely negative view about religion because religion was one of the justifications that were used by slave owners and the slave South to try to keep blacks enslaved. You know, some of those people have a very negative view about institutionalized religion in general, the founders and their religion in general, because of the fact that slavery was tolerated. You could encounter all sorts of these really strong feelings in, in young people when they're in our classes or our youth groups or whatever. Any advice on how we can talk to them in a way that would be productive? Well, I think for a Christian audience, Christian parents talking to your children, I think it's really important to make sure that you highlight for them and you know for yourself what the Bible says about race and what the Bible says about slavery and what the Bible says about segregation and all those things and ensure that those students or children understand very clearly that the Bible in no way tolerates racial discrimination. Yeah, I so guess that, we'd say Gentile or Jew, servant or free, woman or man, right? No more. Yeah. All of that is supposed to be gone, uh, according to St. Paul, right? Yeah, we are one body. And so I think that's one of the ways you start there. Dr. Tony Evans has some amazing sermons about race. He really highlights what the Bible says about those things in very a very clear and biblical way. And, you know, I would encourage any of your listeners to listen to some of those sermons. Um, you can find them anywhere on YouTube on his app. And that I think that's a good place to start is the Bible. I think the next step is to really help solidify a child's identity. 
them understanding that identity is in God, not in man's view of you. And the moment, you know, you embrace that as a Christian, then you understand why race could never be the deciding factor in your future, because you understand that only God has that authority if you allow it. And ultimately, man's view of you is not going to dictate what happens to you unless, you know, you, you in some way sort of succumb to that view. You know, I know a lot of Christian parents that try to shy away from certain topics, abortion and um, same-sex relationships and things like that. But you really can't shy away from that stuff. And you definitely can't shy away from conversations about race either. Because if you, if you don't know what to say and you don't know what to think, then somebody's going to tell them what to say and think. And so you got to know those answers for yourself. You, you have to do the studying yourself. You have to understand why the Bible doesn't agree with some of the things that the culture champions right now. And being able to articulate that very clearly to children so that they can ar articulate those things for themselves in conversations that are inevitably going to come up. The, you know, the attitude I talked about a few minutes ago about, you know, students who might say, I'm closed minded to Christianity because mm. of its justification. I mean, uh, is there a way for, you know, somebody to sort of address that without pushing that person even further away from God? I think you definitely start with the fact that the Bible doesn't justify it. That was man's use of the Bible. And one of the reasons why slave owners did not want slaves being able to read is because they didn't want them to be reading the Bible and knowing that what the slave masters were telling them wasn't true. And so I think that's at least one way of understanding the weapon that was created out of the Bible, you know, in, in sort of illegitimately using scripture to accomplish their immoral ends, the slave masters' immoral ends. And then no way was that a, a Christian point of view or a Christian perspective. Also acknowledging the fact that the church did in many ways justify slavery. They justified Jim Crow, you know, the white church in the South, uh, you know, often saw these things happening and didn't say anything about it, which was sin on their part. And I think the church is constantly dealing with the consequences of that sin. And that's the reason why we don't have a bigger voice in some of these other areas, because we've lost a lot of credibility. I think that's just kind of the foundation is the truth, right? Uh, the church is in a pretty difficult place in the culture, but in that in large part is because of how they behaved when it, be when it came to slavery and Jim Crow and all of those things. So we definitely have some ground to cover in getting back that integrity. Well, I really appreciate, no, I think that I think you're right. This has been really informative and I really appreciate uh, all the time that you've taken to talk to us today. If our listeners want to just learn more about you or any of your writings, do you have a website or anything that you would direct them to? Yeah, I actually uh, have a website, Keisha Tony with an I, Russell.com. I'll be building that up a lot more. I'm actually working on a book that will be published with Harvest House in 23. What's, um, the, uh, what's the topic of that book? Uh, well, the topic and the current title, which may change, is When Christianity and Culture Collide. We'll be talking about some of the things we talked about today in the book, but also, you know, how Christians can try and gain back some of that integrity and even our power as American citizens by understanding the power of the law and the Constitution. Wonderful. Well, great. Thank you so much again, Keisha, for taking time today. Uh, it has been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tony. In our entertainment segment today, I review the movie The Best of Enemies. It came out in 2019 and tells the true story of both a rivalry and a friendship between African-American civil rights activist Ann Atwater and a local leader of the Ku Klux Klan, C.P. Ellis, played by Sam Rockwell. Now, when this movie came out, it didn't get a lot of attention, and I think that's a shame because it's a great movie, especially for kids probably over the age of 12, to not only learn a bit more about the history of segregation and racism in the South during the 1960s and 70s, but more importantly, to see that race does not need to be a barrier even between people who appear to be, as the movie says, the best of enemies. Now, I think the movie is very well done it is rated PG-13 because of violence, racial epithets, including a liberal use of the N-word, so it's definitely for older kids. 
But what I love about this movie is it shows how even people who have lifelong prejudices can have that hatred broken down, just getting to know each other and be open to each other as people all made in the image and likeness of God. It's a movie that focuses on one incident in Durham, North Carolina, where Anne Atwater is trying to petition the city council to allow black students to be integrated into some of the local white schools after a segregated school catches on fire and becomes unusable. Now, C.P. Ellis turns out to be the local exalted cyclops of the KKK, in other words, the president of the local chapter, so he is a very unlikely character who could in some way turn the events in favor of integrating the schools under this set of circumstances. But over the course of the movie, we see some real growth in C.P.'s character as he gets to know Anne Atwater a little better. And as he's confronted with the real life conditions of this school that burned down, and has to take a good look in the mirror about not only his own character, but how his overt racism is impacting his family and the community. Now, this movie was criticized on several fronts. They thought it focused far too much on the life of the KKK president and not enough on civil rights leader Ann Atwater. That's probably a fair commentary. But in some ways, I think that's what makes the movie so great as a way of breaking down race barriers, because it's on his part that you see the most change as his respect for and later friendship with Ann Atwater breaks down generational barriers of hatred and racism. And it's based on a true story, which is truly remarkable because CP and Ann become lifelong friends. So the movie's not perfect, but I think its message ultimately of redemption and overcoming barriers to racial harmony is one that this country needs more and more today. For that reason, I recommend the movie The Best of Enemies to help broach the difficult topic of race. That's all the time we have for the show today. We spoke with Keisha Russell about race relations and how to speak with kids about the issue of race. And I reviewed the race relations movie based on a true story, The Best of Enemies. Again, this is Anthony Barone Kolank, and this has been The Shepherd's Pie. If any of you listening today have a question for me or a topic you'd like to have us cover on the show, please drop me a line on my website at antonykolank.com. That's A-N-T-O-N-Y-K-O-L-E-N-C dot com. Also, if you visit my website, you can learn more about my historical fiction series for kids, The Hardwood Mysteries. I'll end, as always, with my wife's favorite scripture quote from Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. May the Lord bless and keep you this week.